Uh, John Markov is a veteran journalist who's written about technology for the New York Times, among many other publications. He is a fellow of the Society of Professional Journalists, which is the organization's highest honor. And in 2013, he was awarded a Pulitzer Prize in explanatory reporting as a part of a New York Times project on labor and automation. He's the author of several books, including The High Cost of High Tech, Takedown, and Machines of Loving Grace. He is currently the journalist in residence at Stanford's Institute. Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Please welcome John Markov. And last but not least, Carol Stivers received a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and did her postdoc at Stanford before launching her career in medical diagnostics. She combined her love of writing and her fascination with the possibilities of science to create her first novel, the Mother Code, which is the reason we're here this evening. So please join me in welcoming Carol Stivers. Hello. Take it away, folks. So uh, I'm going to start. Um, as Carr said, I'm Carol Stivers, and I'd like to welcome you to the one week and two day anniversary of the launch of my debut novel, The Mother Code. Um, uh, I, th I want to thank everyone who's out there tuning in, and especially to those of you who have uh, accompanied me on this wild ride to publication during uh, COVID-19 times. Um, before I talk about my book, I wanted to talk just a little bit more about John. Uh, John is reported in Silicon Valley since the mid-1970s, and he joined the New York Times in 1988. And um, as Carr said, he's written a uh, uh, five books, including Machines of Loving Grace that, that focuses on um, robots, artificial intelligence systems, and the people who build them. And as a matter of fact, this is one of the books that I referred to often while I was writing The Mother Code. Um, he's currently writing a biography about Stuart Brand, the creator of the Whole Earth Catalog. Um, so uh, John and I have a connection that goes way back. John was a good friend of my husband, Alan's. Uh, since high school where they raced bicycles together. And uh, John was also the best man at our wedding in 1982. So although we don't see very much of each other, um, it seems like John's always popping up whenever anything momentous is happening in my life. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I'll describe my book a little bit for those of you who don't know. Um, the Mother Code is a, a, a near future science fiction that begins in uh, the year 2049 when a deadly non-viral agent intended for biowarfare spreads out of control, scientists must scramble to ensure the survival of the human race. Um, children who are genetically engineered to survive the threat are placed in the care of large-scale robots, and as a result, a boy named Kai is born alone in America's desert southwest, his only companion, his mother, a super soldier robot named Rosie. Um, the Mother Code is the story of how Kai and his mother grow to better understand both themselves and the world that made them. And it ends with a decision. Will Kai uh, break his bond with his mother or fight to save the only parent he's ever known? So as Carr showed you, this is the U.S. version of the book. And um, behind me, I also have um, the U.K. version, which... Uh, they launched the e-versions in May and uh, the, the hardback in uh, uh, August 25th. And also, this is the Dutch version, which I just received in the mail. It was launched in the Netherlands way back in um, May 21st. So one of the most fun things for me has been to see all the great artwork being inspired by my book. Um, I'll be reading to you tonight first from chapter five of the book. Uh, until the manuscript got to my editor at Random House, uh, this had always been chapter one, and I think it uh, best encapsulates the heart of the story. So here we go with a short reading from the Mother Code, chapter five, June 2060. And for this, I'm going to have to put on my reading glasses. Kai can feel the morning heat spilling through Rosie's hatch cover, flooding his cocoon. As he rubbed the sleep from his eyes, his fingers touched the small bump on his forehead, the rough place where the chip was embedded just under the skin. Your chip is special, Rosie had told him. It is our bond. It was how they knew one another, she said. It was how she spoke to him, except during his speech lessons, she never used her audible voice. 
He reached out to touch the smooth surface of the hatch cover in front of him. Where his fingers made contact, the transparent surface became opaque. An image appeared, a group of men with sun-weathered skin, colorful woven robes draped over their stooped shoulders. Rosie had been teaching him a lesson about people who lived in the desert, a desert much like his, but on the other side of the earth and very long ago. The men in the image, Rosie said, were the keepers of the scrolls, ancient writings like those unearthed from caves over a hundred years before the epidemic. What's that, he asked, pointing to one of the men. Perched atop the man's forehead, a small box was supported by a thin leather strap. Rosie's familiar soft buzz and click filled his mind as she ac accessed the required information. These were called to fill in. Each contained four tiny scrolls in which were written passages taken from a book called the Torah. Beneath her console, her servo motors whirred gently. This book described a set of beliefs that they lived by. You teach me through my tefillin, Kai said, pointing to his own dusty forehead, the chip encased there. Are you my Torah? Rosie paused. She was thinking, compiling her answer as she often did when he asked a difficult question. No, she said. The information that I provide is based purely on fact. It's important to separate beliefs from facts. Withdrawing his hand from the screen, Kai watched the image disappear. He peered through the hatch cover, once more transparent. Outside, the familiar rock formations surrounding their encampment stood firm, their massive red fingers pointing skyward. They were strong like Rosie, undaunted by wind and heat. He had names for all of them, the red horse, the man with a big nose, the gorilla, and the father who balanced his plump, round rock baby forever on his giant knees. Rosie had taught him about how humans used to live. She was his mother. He supposed then that the rocks were his family, the guardians who, along with Rosie, had kept watch over him since the day of his birth. He pressed the latch to his left, the sun's heat assailing him as the hatch door swung open. He scrambled down over Rosie's treads to reach the ground, coming face to face with his own reflection in the pocked mirror of her metallic surface. His skin was tanned and freckled, streaked with dust. A, a cloud of reddish brown hair framed his head and blue eyes tw twinkled from beneath heavy lashes. Somewhere, Rosie said, there were other children, others like him, but different. Rosie couldn't tell him how many there were now, but in the beginning, there had been 50. When the time was right, they would find them. So before we move on to questions, I, I just wanted to show you a cartoon version that my daughter hooked up of what Rosie looks like. Um, there's a urge, I think, for readers to anthropomorphize robots, but this is the picture I kept in my mind when writing Rosie and the other mothers in my story. As you can see, she's very utilitarian with no face or eyes. And she normally isn't waving like this, but that's just a cute little logo that uh, Jeannie drew for me. <laughs> so with that, let's move on to questions from you, John. Great. Well, that was a good read. And uh, the book was also a good read. It was, uh, it was something that pulled me through. So it, it's a fun ride and I recommend it. Um, but I wanted to actually, and we'll come to AI and robots, but I wanted to start on the biological side of the coin. And I wanted to ask you, how weird is it to publish a book on a pandemic in the midst of a pandemic? Um, yeah. I think you've said that you weren't actually prescient. Is that true? Yeah, I, definitely not. So I started writing this book in 20... I really started writing it in earnest. I got the, the first idea for in 2003, but I didn't start writing it in earnest till uh, 2011. Uh, but even then, um, I think a virus of the sort that we're dealing with right now was the furthest thing from my mind. So um, I feel like, uh, yeah, a lot of people have written reviews uh, uh, that, that say that I'm talking about COVID and all that. I, I definitely am not in my, uh, the nasty agent in my book is not a virus. Yes. Not a virus. As a matter of fact, I just did some uh, edits on uh, to, for the uh, version. And I, I actually added back in a line from one of the characters saying, this is not a virus, <laughs> so that people would understand that. And at the time I wrote it, I was more focused in on um, my fear, actually a real fear of, of biowarfare. And, and so I was more concerned about that than any, any virus that might attack us. So distinguish your, um, your, your critter 
from a virus. So a virus is a bit of DNA that can, uh, molecular stuff that can take over a cell and reproduce itself. How does your protagonist differ? <laughs> My antagonist, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, so, you know, viruses have, a, you know, a viral coat and, and coat proteins and stuff, and that's how they latch onto the cell and, you know, send their, send their uh, nasty DNA into the cell. Uh, in the case of mine, uh, it's based on a, uh, something called spherical nucleic acids, which are being studied actually uh, at uh, the uh, Nanotechnology Institute at um, uh, Northwestern University. And that's how I got the idea for them. Um, they're actually being developed as therapeutics and uh, vaccines, actually. Um, and what they can do, because of their spherical and nano particulate structure, they can actually get into the cell without the need for um, a virus. Because a lot of times when people do um, when, when people do therapeutics with DNA right now, sometimes they actually use a virus to introduce the DNA into the cell. And they use all kind of tricks, you know, vesicles and things like this. But this uh, has the property of being able to get through the outer wall of the cell. Um, I took it one step further because the ones that are developed so far cannot get in through the, the nucleal, the wall of the nucleus of the cell. So they wouldn't be able to do the things that my things do. But I just thought, oh my gosh, what if somebody launched something and it could actually, um, you know, get in through you breathing it in. And so that was, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but John, could you uh, move closer to the microphone? Yeah, sorry. Okay. I'm Thanks. Wrong. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, and you called it an ICNAN. I think that was your, your acronym. Um, which uh, raises, immediately raises um, the question of um, uh, ICE-9. Uh, <laughs> yes. Sorry, you, you weren't thinking about that, though. No, <laughs> no, so, so actually... Uh, interesting parallels. Yeah, one of the first uh, uh, agents to offer representation uh, was the first one to bring that up, and, and the first, that's the first time I thought about it. I had, I, I'm a huge fan of Kurt Vonnegut, and I had read uh, I guess it's Mr. Rosewater where he talks about ice nine where, you know, you put it in water and it just freezes it. Um, mine is, a, it was a, a initiator caspase nucleic ana, uh, acid nanostructure. So that's what I, I see NAN stands for. And so I wasn't thinking of ice nine. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but um, it, let's see, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure that I, here's the reason that I, you haven't been I mean, this should be better. I should be clearer now. Is that, can you hear me? Yes. Good. yes. Apologies. I was using I can. the microphone. And I didn't figure that out. Um, so uh, you spend a lot of time in, at Stanford basically doing research for this to, uh, were you, were you, were, you were reading basic scientific material? Well, you know, I think I told you that I that I had tried to figure out a way to kill most pe pe people on Earth without killing animals, etc. Uh, and <laughs> that's a terrible thing to be doing. But anyways, um, I, I did a lot of research on it until I was driving home one day and I heard this professor talking about these particular spherical nucleic acids. And I went home and watched a couple of TED Talks that he had done. And I realized, okay, this is what I should do. So, so I spent some time in the basement of the Lane Library over at Stanford studying ways to kill people off. But I, I and I didn't, I didn't want it to be a virus. I specifically did not want to use a virus because um, all the planets of the apes had just come out, and you know, there's a virus, and you know, viruses have been done. And in the case of a virus, thank God, we, we can uh, usually develop an immunity to them. We can develop vaccines against them, this sort of thing. So um, I wanted it to be something uniquely and uniquely awful uh, that, that could be spread just basically. Uh, but, you know, the, the whole idea that uh, it's not contagious. So I don't catch it from you. You don't catch it from me. We catch it from the air. So it's basically, I had in my mind that it was more like climate change. It's more like something that we're doing that's irreversible to, to kind of damage the very air that we breathe. And this one is like just deadly. And, you know, the way it gets into the bacteria, the bacteria spread it around, it, you know, it's kind of an unexpected thing. 
Um, but people need to understand the, that about things that they release into the environment, you know, kind of the chain reaction and the domino effect. Yeah. So those are the sorts of things I had in mind. Did you ever think that it might be too real? Uh, uh, there's a reason I'm asking this in the sense of, so, you know, when I um, began researching machines loving grace, I discovered that many of the people who early on went into the field of AI and robotics were inspired by science fiction. Yeah. And, you know, people think about Jules, Jules Verne as a science fiction author that came up with ideas that were then, uh, but in fact, um, you know, uh, so both, uh, you know, a number of early AI scientists that I interviewed um, were actually inspired by seeing um, Space Odyssey, and they saw HAL, and their reaction was, I want to build that. And they mm -hmm. uh, went on and, you know, went into the field of AI. Um, uh, you know, even, even more recently, uh, for example, there was a very famous Apple um, uh, sort of uh, video done in 1987 by John Scully called Knowledge Navigator. And two young AI researchers saw that, and uh, this is Tom Gruber and Adam Shire, and they went off and designed uh, Siri. So there was a direct connection between the sort of the vision and mm -hmm. the actual reality of science. And, and so, um, I was thinking because I was talking this morning to George Church, the molecular biologist at Harvard, oh, yeah. and he's involved in a DIY vaccine project where they've created these, uh, and I don't know enough about the science, but they sounded, they sounded like kind of similar to IC9s in their design. I mean, they're nanotechnology based things that they're already putting into their noses to, I mean, this is going on right now. And I began to think, well, what could go wrong kind of? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, as I said, the, the work at, uh, uh, I don't know if he's in cahoots with the people at uh, uh, Northwestern because that's exactly what they wanted to do. And in the case, in that case, they have to add an adjuvant, right, to spur the uh, immune response and then, and then uh, eject. But, but that's all really right now very pie in the sky. And like I said, it, it's, it's not capable um, I'd have to look into it. I'd be interested afterwards to find out more about George Church's <laughs> stuff because uh, they weren't capable. Well, they were just on the verge, I think, of being able to get it into the nucleus of the cell where it could do the real thing. Um, yeah. But, but, yeah. So when you say, what I, was I thinking it was real? Um, one of the things about these spherical nucleic acids is they're incredibly unstable and really difficult to stabilize. And so the idea that they could you know, just be out in the desert somewhere, or, you know, in the environment is really kind of far-fetched. Um, but I, I kind of came up with a mechanism by which it might happen, but it's all very, very far-fetched, okay. uh, luckily. Okay. <laughs> so you mentioned a, um, an initial idea that got you started in 2003. What was the germ of the book? Oh, so uh, my husband and I were taking a trip in the desert Southwest and I, you know, I, I was, we were driving through an area that just had nobody in it. And I saw this truck by the side of the road and it was kind of like in the ditch. And it was, I don't know if you ever saw the Cadillac ranch in, in, uh, in Texas, you know, where that guy buried all these Cadillacs up to the front windshield. It was kind of like that. It was just like half buried. And I remember like, you know, craning my neck and, and wondering, is there somebody inside there? And just having this kind of apocalyptic vision of what it would be like to be alone in this desert. And, you know, and I was worried at the time, actually, that our car was going to break down and nobody was going to find us. So I felt like um, at the same time, my daughter was watching uh, Japanese mecha anime. She was really into it. And uh, in this idea of a uh, well, you know, uh, getting off topic a little bit, uh, Elon Musk is doing this now, the brain machine interface idea or neural lace, they call. Yes. Um, but just an idea that you would kind of meld your mind with the, the, the mind of a machine. And I, I got this idea for a, a child that would be inside of a robot that would be his mother and he'd be able to kind of intuitively speak with her in the way that Kai does. And that really grabbed me. Um, the kind of bond that they would share that would be so much, maybe even more than a, a human boy with his human mother because they would just be joined at the hip that way. So those kind of ideas were what was percolating, you know, when it, when it, it kind of everything else in the book kind of stems from that. 
words, yeah. you know, those original ideas. You've gotten to the sort of most in, intimate discussion of a question that's now going on throughout the field of AI about what is our relationship to these machines. And I can't think of a more sort of intimate relationship than a child to their mother. Um, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's a fraught, it's also a very fraught discussion. Um, when I was uh, writing Machines of Love and Grace, what I was sort of, I came, I came into this discussion that the people who are designing the machines are actually having now about what should the relation be between humans and machines, and you know, should we be, um, should 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 we be their masters? Uh, should we be their servants, or should we be partners? And um, you you know, and, and particularly when you go in that direction of building a human machine interface, um, the stuff that's going on now in the world of robotics makes me, um, and, and this takes us back to science fiction, makes me very worried about those kinds of relationships if that technology was ever possible. Um, I, I trust you've seen Star Trek to know about that alien species called the Borg. Yes, of course. <laughs> you know, this, is this, my this, favorite. Yeah. <laughs> but it just, you know, it, it just never works out well. Um, already, I mean, the research um, that's going on in the robotics, some of the most interesting research in the world of robotics is how, how ro robots learn. And one of the aspects that, um, you know, people at Berkeley, for example, are exploring is, you know, if you teach a robot something, immediately all of the robots know it. Learning in the robotic world is not like learning in the human world. You don't have any of these transmission problems. It's just replicate that learned experience, which is definitely a board like kind of question. And I don't know if you, you know, so then you jump to the notion of a, of a robot in, in printing, you know, emotional stuff on a human being, and you're into a very deep kind of yeah. philosophical so world. In my, in my book, I actually, I, I thought about that. I said, you know, there's this 10th convention or 5th convention, I can't remember, on, on robotics that, that occurs on account of the, all of these concerns. And um, so one of the things that built, that's built into my mother's is they're incapable of communicating with each other. Um, they can only communicate with their children and that was on purpose because yeah, yeah this idea that they could form this kind of like ro robot army in a way <laughs> they got together and started comparing notes you know something like this so um that, that you know goes back to something that i tried to cover there yeah yeah so the other question i wanted is how did you decide to set the time period i think you the book starts in 2049 and it's always an interesting question for me because I've, I've really watched the pace of technological change in Silicon Valley for a long time. Oh, gee, I can't be, you know, I'm, I'm busy working on another book right now and I know why I placed it. Now, i <laughs> trying to think what, what exactly spurred me to start it around then. Um, you weren't I, driven by sort of guesses on the pace of technology, were you? I know what it was because I wanted my characters to have been born right about the time that I was writing. I and so, so for example, my character James was born in 2014. Um, I wanted nobody. Yeah. I wanted them to have been born right around now. And so that kind of pushed everything, basically their own personal timelines pushed yeah. everything. Cause we're, we're, you know, um, from covering Silicon Valley for three or four decades, I've, I've come away with the realization that we're really bad at guessing the pace of technology. Yeah. Often things happen, but um, what is it? Objects in the mirror are closer than they, they may appear or whatever. I mean, you, know, well, you know, one thing I, I wanted to uh, point out, you know, is people always think that technologies are much further along than they currently are, you know, so, so there's a lot of futurists who will write books, these scary books about, you know, robot overlords and things that they just don't understand where, where technology is. But in the case of biology, I really do think that this idea of, um, that happens in my book so smoothly and easily that you think, oh, we're already doing this, but we're not, is, is, is growing embryos, you know, genetically engineering embryos and growing them entirely in artificial milieus, you know, it's just not done. It's impossible. Yeah. So, you know, cause you, you can, you can, what they call test tube baby is actually developed in a test tube and then put into a woman. You, there's no case where a baby has been entirely born in a, so that whole thing, that whole science that, that James does in my book is just really 
kind of outlandish. That's nice. Um, yeah. 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 That's so. Um, there's a, a couple of parts of the backstory of your book. First of all, I want to ask you about Hollywood. One of the, the first things I learned about your book is you'd actually sold it as a movie very early on. Tell, oh. tell me about about selling the book as a movie. So that was shocking. I I got a. I got my signed with my agent in uh, April 2018, and we didn't. Uh, she had me rewriting major sections of it for most of the summer, and so we never went to publishers until um, September 2018, right after Labor Day. So almost exactly two years ago now, we we uh, went to publishers, and then meanwhile, I think about a week or maybe exactly as, as she was sending out to publishers, she said, do you mind if I send this to my friend, Michelle Wiener at, at um, uh, CAA, uh, Creative Ar Artist Agency in Hollywood? And I said, you know, who am I to say no to that? And um, she and uh, uh, Michelle had done a couple of different deals and with books and been very successful. So um, then the, like the following, I think it was like, Really, literally, the following Monday, I was waiting for my husband outside a fish store here, and you know, in the parking lot. And I looked at my phone, and I had a call from uh, Elizabeth, my my uh, agent. And she, you know, I never don't take her calls, so uh, she she says, "Are you at home?" I said, "No, I'm not at home." She says, "You need to get home because Michelle wants to call you." And I just knew, you know, I knew nothing about this, and and it's the first time actually that Elizabeth had ever sold a book prior to finding a publisher to, to Hollywood, right? So um, while we were still looking for a publisher, she, uh, Michelle was sending it out to producers in Hollywood and I was getting calls from Hollywood producers at the same time I was taking calls from, from publishers. And thank God I got a publishing deal because um, we, weren't, we weren't really allowed to talk about the, the thing, you know, the, the Hollywood thing too much with, with the publisher, so it wasn't like a selling point. Uh, all, all that uh, Elizabeth was able to say is, "Oh, there's some interest. There's a lot of interest." You know, so, so, and I remembered seeing something by John Grisham about the firm and how he had written it and couldn't find a publisher, couldn't find. A, and after 14 years, 14 not 14 years, but like I think it was 14 months later, um, he got a, an offer for a movie, and so then they had to find a publisher. So. Uh, but anyways, it worked out a very tight timing there, finding the publisher. And, I and, and, it's, it's kind of a fairy tale for a first time published author to also. Yes. Have would be My like. head was, was <laughs> spinning and I, and the, the kind of things that these people will call you and tell you about your book is just very heady. I mean, it's, it's the two worlds in New York and Hollywood are very different. So Hollywood, you tend to get very effusive people calling you and just telling you you're a goddess and you're, you're the most amazing thing ever. And then from the publishers, it's like, well, we think we might take this on. What do you think about, you know, we'll, we'll you know, fool around with the beginning a little bit. And, you know, this, so it's a two entirely different yeah. takes on well, the same thing. It also, you know, it wasn't an overnight wonder. The fact that you started in 2003 and here we are in 2020. Yeah. I mean, forever. <laughs> well, uh, talk to me a little bit about writing the book and how, how you work as a writer and how much of a struggle it was, or was it easy? Was it hard? Well, well so how I want to work on as a writer going forward is much different from the way I wrote this book. It was a learning experience. Yeah, I was consulting uh, as a biotech for pretty much the entire time I was writing it. So I would, you know, be consulting and then in my spare time writing. And I tended to write in fits and spurts. I wrote um, sections out of order. I um, was, I had characters and killed them off. And I, it, you know, it was kind of a mess. And it, it was a, not the kind of process that I followed. Uh, uh, for example, when I, I wrote the, the, the Butterfly Garden for online, which is a mystery in 10 parts, or I, I'm writing my next novel, I'm, I'm trying to be much more regimented. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what process I would like to have, and that is that, that I, I have to have a beginning, I have to have an end, and I have to envision that it's book length, it's novel length, and then uh, I try to write beats that take me through from the beginning to the end, and see, and then I follow the beats, and um, 
as I go along, I'm allowed to, to diverge, you know, divert off of that. But um, another pointer that I got from my, my agent, which was extremely helpful, was to, to always keep coming back to what themes am I trying to express? Like, if, I, if I'm going off on a tangent, because in, in the mother code, it's so easy to go off on a tangent. You've got the whole world to play with. What are you going to center yourself on? And so that really helped me to keep focused in the final writes and rewrites on, yeah. on the themes that I wanted to express. So, so yeah, I have, have changed a lot <laughs> as a writer. I don't, I don't think I'll ever write the way I did then because I would never get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever deal with, do you ever, are you ever faced with writer's block? How, how disciplined are you as a writer? Uh, I don't think, I don't, no, I don't. I think now I'm more driven than ever. I, and a lot of it has to do with our shelter in place and a lot of anxiety. Um, right now I'm writing to stave off anxiety. And so I found myself, unlike some others that I, meet up with in, in my writers groups and such, I, I, I tend to be more productive, not less productive, because I, my focus on that will take my focus off all the other awful things that are happening in the world. And I kind of, in the same way that, you know, like when you're reading a really good book, I kind of like to dig in and live in that world that I'm writing. And so it kind of takes me away from. I'm actually very impressed. And I'm actually exactly the opposite. I was <laughs> working on finishing my biography of Stuart Brand in the midst of COVID. And I think it basically doubled the time, even though I should have had all this free time just to focus. I, I found infinite ways to distract myself. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, all of a sudden our dance cards were empty here. You know, I mean, we had so, my husband and I, we had so many things to go out and do and busy, busy, busy. And all of a sudden we just had, within a period of two weeks, we had nothing. And so, I, you know, sitting there in my anxiousness, I started writing. And... Yeah. So uh, the, the picture of um, your mother robot is very interesting to me because I've thought a lot and written some about um, robots that work in close proximity to humans. And I've seen the research and the development work um, to make it possible um, to, uh, for, for uh, machines and humans to collaborate. And it's really, really hard. Um, mm -hmm. particularly if you use um, non-biological materials and you need to be able to move at speeds and with strength, um, you know, the, it's very easy to hurt humans. Um, you know, yeah. uh, you know a carbon fiber arm swinging at a, a decent speed, if it runs into a human, it's not good, or even titanium for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so I've wondered, you know, if robots, when they finally emerge, would actually be soft and made out of biological material rather than out of uh, more, you know, inanimate forms. Yeah, I, I think the the ones that you know you see coming out of Japan and so is, is are are right. They are very soft things. Yeah. And and uh, you know, one of the things I did watch some sessions with Sebastian Thrun, you know, from Stanford, who is who was conducting, I think it was, how was it called, that, that learning uh, site that you could go to and take courses. Um, and I would sit in on those. And, and that's where I got the idea of this, this hand with the inside coming out that would interact with the child instead of this really hard gauntlet um, was from one of those classes because he talked about materials and he talked about uh, sensors in the materials. And, you know, there's a lot of also tech that goes around um, uh, was a prosthesis yeah. that that is also um, centered on on uh, on that sensing the the interface between like your leg or your arm and that prosthesis so that it's not like rubbing and you know yeah. harming you. But yeah, no, that's a real concern, and and, and these the, mothers the, had to be careful. The other challenge in terms of timing is you know when you assume machine autonomy, um, it, it you know. Despite our belief, for example, that cars will be self-driving soon, um, I think it's going to be a longer, a longer journey mm -hmm. than most people think. I mean, maybe if you if you see if you assume 2049, then anything is possible. I mean, as 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 a journalist covering Silicon Valley, anything more than three years out for me was always in the realm of science fiction, because all the so-called visionaries could never look very far out into the future. 
you know, one, one thing I, I, you know, picked up on it, like, so James, when he goes places, he rides in an auto cab, right? So an auto cab is a, a totally automated vehicle that you just sit in the back and it's like a taxi. Um, but there, uh, when he drives, there is always an, uh, a manual mode. And I, and I thought about that handoff problem that you discussed in your book, um, because people, you know, for one reason or another, they, I think they're always going to want to have a little bit of control over something that they're driving or riding around in. Um, so I left that in. <laughs> yeah, the handoff problem has not been solved yet because yeah. uh, people who are um, reading email or playing Warcraft are going to have, it's, it's called situational awareness and you have about a half a second to get back in situational awareness during that handoff mm -hmm. time and it's just not going to be possible. So it was always, I mean, in, in that debate about autonomous vehicles, it, you know, there's these five levels of autonomy. And I think the consensus at this point is you're gonna to have to be at level five to actually, you know, the, the machine is not gonna to have to be able to call on the human for a little help in a tight situation. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, so when I want to go back to that notion of imprinting humanity on a child and sort of take me through thinking about the relationship between the machine and the human and sort of how to transfer humanity from a machine to a human. Oh, so, so, you know, the whole idea of the mother code was really just a, you know, giving the bot a kind of a learning database to go by. Um, and, you know, you talk about what is a, teaching learning sets or whatever it is, uh, you know, they're always going to be limited. Um, so the women would, you know, they would make endless videos and model the behavior of the bot. And so I even have later the bot, some, some a few of the bots have a few mannerisms, which they literally gained from the mothers that the women that they're based on. Uh, maybe ho hovering or, or, or just uh, leaning a certain way or whatever. Um, but most of the kind of machine human interface that happens between the child and the bot is really in their, in, in the, in the child's head, you know, and the fact that she can sense his emotions and that she can respond, uh, accordingly, um, for the first, most of the book, um, uh, you know, you get the sense that Rosie is, is pretty limited in what she can do. She, she has certain mission certain parameters that she needs to fulfill but uh she's limited to just sensing certain emotions in him responding to his uh queries in a kind of a so socratic learning method yeah. and um and then they built in things like imprinting on a human face for a while when the baby's very small so that would allow the baby to kind of know that he was human and and, and this sort of thing it's um, so I just kind of wove those, those things in there and, and the fact that, you know, these were designed by psychologists as well as roboticists that they were thinking about what it would be like to be a human alone with a robot and, 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 and how would you come out of that not being a totally strange individual, <laughs> uh, that you'd be able to um, socialize with other humans if you were to come upon them, you yeah. know what to do. Well, you know, I, which brings me to the this question of brain machine interfaces, which are also now in largely in the realm of science fiction, although, you know, Elon Musk has a company in this area and there are lots, actually lots and lots of other activity. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether or not it's possible, at the, you, know, you know, at the end of sort of my work in Machines Loving Grace, I decided that the most important thing about the relationship in, between humans and machines was to keep a bright line between what is machine and what is human. Mm -hmm. And the possibility in, implicit in very machine interfaces is to cross, to blur that line. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like it, it, it can, it, 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 the possibility is there for having a really bad outcome in, in any case where you yeah. blur the line. <laughs> I, I really do think so. And, and, you know, that's why some of the adult characters in my book, you know, have a, a fair degree of skepticism and, and concern about it, right? They, they don't think it's a good thing. Um, it was done out of a necessity because they felt like there was going to be nobody there to care for these children and they had to have something or someone. So 
but when they realize that um, you know they can make a difference, they try to because I think they agree with you there that it, it just doesn't look right. It doesn't seem right, and it could get out of hand. And you know, so yeah. and things and things happen in my book, which which are do seem from the outside very threatening. So it, it's you know something needs to be done, kind of thing. So no, I I, I, I totally got that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it just seems that our humanity is based um, probably more than anything in our, uh, in our, you know, in our separateness from each other. I mean, if you go to someone like Martin Buber, you know, his humanism is grounded in I and thou, and there needs to be an I and the thou, and then when the mm -hmm. I and the thou blur, then you're in a different, maybe it's better or different, it'll be def different, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not human. You know, I, I know like lately I've been reading, I wrote, uh, it was a How to Change a Mind by Your Mind by uh, oh, yes. Colin. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. You're, you're, you're mentioned in that book, by the way. I, <laughs> your name is in there. Um, the, you know, you're talking about you using uh, uh, low dose psychedelics to, to erase the ego and stuff. And it, it's very interesting idea um, that, you know, there's a lot of people out there and Stuart Brand probably among them that, that feels like, you know, that, I don't know, you can talk to that, but, uh, you know, that, that it would be better if we didn't all have such big egos and we weren't all so separate, but it's... I, I haven't asked Stuart about that specifically. I know that he, although he was very early to LSD, he actually stopped taking it in, uh, in 1969. Yeah. He, he figured he'd gotten what he can out of it. Um, yeah, that, you know, uh, we talked a little bit uh, before we started about this distinction between AI and IA. Um, you know, in, in, in my book, I was I was con I, I, I was concerned about the dichotomy between these two laboratories on either side of the Stanford campus. One was developing systems that replaced humans. That was John McCarthy's Stanford AI lab, and the other one, which was Doug Engelbart's laboratory, was developing technologies for extending the human. And it was philosophically very different. So the question becomes, how do you, what you know? What's the synthesis of those two approaches to designing the relationship between humans and machines. Yeah, I mean, my robots have something akin to Google aboard them, right? Because that's how the yes. child is learning on the tablet and all. And um, I'll never forget personally, the first time I ever saw Google, it was, it was a coworker uh, called my attention to it because prior to that we had Yahoo and Yahoo was mostly, um, you know, commercial like ads trying to sell you something. Um, but all of a sudden, here's something, and he was, I think very shortly, they had Google Scholar. So uh, it was just, it was, to me, it was mind-blowing to have all of that information at my, my fingertips. And, uh, well, um, and you can also say that Google is the, the quintessential IA creation, because what they did was they simply mined the human, connect, the, the human created connections that were in the web and then fed them back to us. So in Yeah, way, it was, it's, it was an intelligence augmentation, you call it, right? Yeah, yeah. IA. Well, Doug Engelbart called it IA originally. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a different. And you know, um, um, it was probably, um, uh, what was it? It was, it was Steve Jobs who, um, um, you know, referred to personal computers as being bicycles for the mind, which I always thought was the most, uh, you know, wonderfully evocative way of describing yeah. what these machines would do for us. Um, so uh, there are some, yeah, you're, you're back. There are some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks. Great timing. Um, so we have a few questions in the Q&A here. I'll start with uh, Paul asks, uh, because your book and its perspective reflects that, uh, I'll, I'll summarize here, um, because the book is written by a woman and be, perhaps uh, you bring that to your authorship of the book, do you feel that the movie should be directed by a woman? Oh, well, uh, I wouldn't mind one way or another, um, but it would be great. Um, one thing I was really pleased with was right away they signed a woman um, screenwriter, Mary Louise Johnson, who did, um, I think she worked on Firefly, Fi oh God, I can't remember, it was in Firefly. It was one of the George R. R. Martin um, Things. It, it didn't. It was a series on TV that didn't last. Yeah, Firefly past. was great, though. <laughs> I don't think it was Firefly. I may be getting that wrong. Anyways, you can look it up. But uh, yeah, so she's a female um, uh, screenwriter. She also is from San Francisco, and she is a psychologist. So it's so cool that she's like my character Rose. You know. Um, so yeah, I, I I did get a call from um, Sue Kroll. You know, during the time that I was looking at. 
uh, movie deals and uh, she and her crew were, they, they did the Star is Born and Gravity and a couple other movies. And I, I just felt like, wow, they really got my book. And I loved everything they had to say. They just had no money. <laughs> so I wasn't able to go with them. And uh, with, I do hope that uh, you involve as many women as possible. Uh, we have a question here from Jared who asks, what do you consider a more likely threat to humanity? Nanotech getting into the wild, going out of control, or fully, fully autonomous military hardware going out of control? Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, both? I don't know. <laughs> I think it depends on who you ask here between the two of us. I, I just, uh, I think it's probably the nanotech because um, robots, we can turn them off. <laughs> that would be my well, it's very interesting about turning, the question about turning off robots is actually a real one that's now um, before the Pentagon, uh, an advisory committee to the Pentagon has been having that debate about whether these autonomous systems need kill switches. And the bulk of the, uh, the, the argument is against that. Uh, inside that advisory committee right now. So it's not like it's science fiction. It's actually a real question. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> uh, we have here two. Uh, this is from Roy. Hi, Carol. Loving the book and the discussion. I've asked you this before, but knowing that there were extensive revisions guided by your agent and publisher now that it's out i wonder how do you feel about the whole journey is this a clearly better book in your mind or just a different book you mentioned chapter five originally being the opening for instance yeah i i, I really agonized over that switch um that was change was made because uh they felt that uh i was breaking the tension in the adult storyline by going back and forth between the adults and the children and in the early chapters like I had in the original manuscript. And so um, I ended up blocking together a bunch of adult storyline chapters in the beginning and you don't get back to Kai until chapter five. So I did agonize over that. I'm not sure. Uh, some people don't like switching back and forth like that. Uh, they mm -hmm. find it very jarring and especially since it was a different timeline so um, but i think that the second half of the book with all of the editing that happened in the second half it got much much better than it had been it, it was uh less characters wandering around on the page and, and more uh directed action so um, alexa asks You've talked about the technological inspirations for the features in the book, but I was curious how or if your personal experiences as a mother inform the relationship between your characters. Oh, yeah. I think being a parent made all the difference for me. I don't know if I could have written something. Um, there's a lot of parent-child relationships in the book, not just the robots and the children, but, but um, you know, other, other children and parents. And I... You know, I just draw a lot on my own experience there and experience of people that I know um, to in, in, in uh, forming those. And, and there's a lot of, uh, especially through the character of James, I discuss a lot about him and his parents and then him and, and the girl that he adopts. And basically the, the, the secrets that you keep from your children and whether or not you should be totally open with your children about things, the way that you do things to try to protect them. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? And, mm -hmm. and so every parent makes those decisions for themselves. And I think, you know, one thing I've seen lately is people grappling with how much they're gonna tell their children about COVID, you know, how much, or, or you know, political upheaval in the family or whatever, like between different members of the family, uh, how do you shield your children from that? So I, I think a lot about those kind of things and in this very harrowing situation, uh, trying to shield children is, you know, it's something that's very close to my heart. Uh, there's a good question here as well. I want to make sure that, uh, is there a character named Zach in your book? Yeah. 
Okay, I just wanted to make sure it's not, uh, I'm reading it correctly. Uh, uh, Barbara asks, thanks, I've really enjoyed both the book and the conversation. Question, given the mutual learning relationship between the mothers and the children, what does Zach's mother learn from Zach? And what implications does this hold for the future after the book you've written? Well, so I don't want to get too much into that because it's way sure, towards sure. the end of the book. And so it's good. Barbara, give me a call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know who you are. But the, the thing is, I, I, yeah, I think, um, you know, by that, I, I just wanted to illustrate that the, the mothers in the end were learning from their children and mm -hmm. they were capable of doing that. And had been all along. And so that, you know, you can kind of come to some kind of a agreement through this brain machine interface we were talking about, you can come to some kind of humanity that, that they, they can kind of share. Um, Avery asks, can you please share more about your character development process? Well, uh, you know, this is really interesting. During the when I first wrote the book, I based the character uh, of James strangely. If my brother is out there, I don't know if he is on my brother. Um, <laughs> uh, his kind of maybe mild manneredness and skepticism, etc. Um, you tend to kind of find people you can kind of channel when you're writing people. Um, uh, won't go to, into too many details about examples of other people, but when I was rewriting a lot, um, since by then I already had uh, this Hollywood thing going on, I, I kind of channeled some actors and actresses, and that was a really interesting idea because then you can say, okay, um, I think this should be played by so-and-so, and what would they do um, in this situation? And then you can picture them moving through space because you watch actors and actresses um, all the time, and they're, they're able to channel really strong emotions, which, you know, usually the emotions in a book are kind of overblown. The emotions definitely on TV and movies are overblown. Um, you know, writing real people would be kind of boring because we're, we're all very, you know, verklempt and very opaque. But uh, so, so, yeah, I used a combination of those two things. I always have to picture someone in my mind uh what do they look like and how do they move in space so uh next next question is actually pretty relevant to that uh ridley asks for the movie will you have input on the look of the characters no i have no input whatsoever <laughs> so I, I just wanted to share that uh you know tv i guess is the writer's world and movies are the producer's world and so if you if a writer sells their book to a movie place or film, then you pretty much have no say whatsoever. They pay you and you're gone. Um, I'm hoping that they'll use my consulting expertise for some of the technical details. Um, and, and, and they do have that in the contract. But as far as anything else, nope. No input. Uh, MJ asked, do you plan to move to a mega mansion once the movie is out? I had this dream that one day I would live in Tiburon and I'd be looking at <laughs> but I, I you know no <laughs> it's not it was, you know we, we like to travel too much and so probably we'll spend a whole bunch on travel and we love to give to charitable organizations and we'll spend a whole bunch on that uh, just a couple more questions here. Jacqueline asks, I know that you and Alan traveled for this book as well as for your current manuscript. Can you talk about your approach to research, especially mixing things that exist with future concepts? Oh, so for the, the mixing things with future concepts, I do a lot of book reading, you know, like, like, like John's book and other books that, you know, futurist type books. Um, uh, for the travel, for what I like to gain from travel is like sensory uh, details. Like so, so if if you uh, for this one, you know, going to the desert southwest, going to Los Alamos, spending a lot of time in the Presidio, which I always have. I love that place. Um, it, it just gives you the the feel of the place, and you can describe the sights and the sounds and the smells. In that so that's what I get out of the, the kind of the travel 
And, mm -hmm. and one thing I do notice is that since I'm a writer, I think I'm a better traveler. I really do pay a lot more attention mm -hmm. to details in the places where I visit. Uh, briefly, Meryl says, I'm on the East Coast and have to hop off, but this was lovely and interesting. Congrats, Carol. Hey, Meryl. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nancy asks, uh, Nancy says, sci-fi typically doesn't appeal to me, but I love your book. Where on the spectrum of sci-fi to humanity would you place your book? Oh, so, you know, it was a thing. It was a discussion that was had. I was acquired by um, Cindy Wang at Penguin Random House, and she acquires books both for Ace, which is a sci-fi imprint, and also for Berkeley, which is more like a... Um, uh, romance and, and that sort of thing, uh, thrillers and things. And she actually thought originally that she was going to place it with Ace and then they had a big discussion and decided to put it with Berkeley and then pitch it to kind of both ways. And so I've had a really interesting experience of going on podcasts uh, like Functional Nerds or Inverse Sci-Fi or things like that. And then on the other hand, being on podcasts like Storymaker Show or, or, or things where we're talking about more kind of writerly things. And I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of me and my friends who are writing liter what we call literary science fiction. And I, I, you know, I think a lot of the sci-fi that I read, I think John and I discussed this prior, um, the sci-fi that I read growing up was very testosterone poisoned and, um, very <laughs> and not very literary. Um, <laughs> yeah, all your favorites. And it had, um, you know, but, but now I'm reading some books that I'm just blown away by that are actual science fiction, but they're just so well written. So I think uh, that's where I would love to be placed myself. Uh, let's see. Doug asks, was The Mother Code uh, the original title? So the original title was uh, New Dawn Gen 5. It was very uh sci fi -y. and mm -hmm. I picked up on the mother code about five years before finding an agent. I just thought no it was never it was a working title. It was never a good title. And as I got into the book I thought what phrase from the book would best represent what the book is about. And so that's mm -hmm. when I picked up on the mother code. Mm -hmm. The mother code is also a phrase that's used in genetics, right? So the mother code is the mm -hmm. mother code of, of certain um uh, uh, species, etc., would be the, the code that's in, you know, the DNA code. So there's a lot of kind of nuance to, to that phrase, the mother code. Uh, and one last question from Lori. Uh, Hi, Carol. It's a wonderful book. Any plans for a sequel? No sequel. I'm on to something entirely different. So <laughs> I'm going to... Um, uh, I want my next one is going to be like uh, more more uh, directed towards something I think is a, is a big threat, which is climate change, and mm. I'm going to be weaving that in. Um, I really just didn't have any idea what would happen after this, and I wanted people to imagine that. And if anyone wants to write a sequel and have me help them, I would do that. But I don't have any plans for one myself. Great. Um, thank you so much for joining us, both of you. It's been a treat and thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Just gonna give uh, one more visual of Carol's book here, uh, The Mother Code. Both John and Carol's books are available for sale at Green Apple Books, just to mention here. Uh, this was lovely. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Of course, have a good night.